it's it's not over it's just different you're listening to online pet health podcasts with dr megan kelly continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists learn more at onlinepethealth.com Hey Vet Rehabbers, today I chat with Sarah McKeegan from Nova Scotia and she has a practice called Upward Dog Rehab. She talks to me about her own personal experience with having a dog diagnosed with degenerative myelopathy, how much it's taught her and also allowed her now to be able to help her clients as well as pet owners all over the world. For those of you that are interested in this condition, Debbie Taraka did a great lecture on degenerative myelopathy, which is on the online pet house small animal members platform. I also went and had a look to see what other neurological rehabilitation lectures we have. And we have 14 hours of webinars that are available for learning for vet rehab therapists. I chose four, which I thought would be really applicable to those of you that are interested in this, these type of cases. And those are assisted devices, troubleshooting the neuro patient, and then there's two hours of lectures on hydrotherapy for neurological cases. So, so much learning on the small animal platform. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Sarah. Hey, Sarah, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me, Meg. It's a pleasure to be back. Sarah, we are going to be chatting about um, living with dogs with disabilities. And um, you have a personal story around this. Why don't you share with the listeners your story? Certainly. It's actually the kind of the beginning of my whole canine rehab journey because I had a completely different life before my dog actually hurt herself. And the journey kind of began back in terms of, and I'm using the word disability just to clarify very broadly um, in this sense, but um, Sammy, my white German shepherd was playing with my other dog, Reggie, who was a red golden. And it was winter time in the woods and she yelped. She came out of the woods on three legs and well, you probably know what happened, but that was, you know, I was thinking, you know, walk it off. Come on, you'll be okay. And it became very apparent very quickly as I'm back in the woods off this trail that she was not going to walk it off. She had a cruciate tear. Um, And at that point, I wasn't a rehab therapist. I wasn't a physiotherapist. So my background is a physiotherapist with a diploma in canine rehab. At that point, I wasn't doing either of those things. And I went through all of those emotions you go through when your dog gets injured panic (laughs) Um, and then wanting to do something about it right away to make it better and you know she went through I did CC a TPLO on her first leg rehabbed her at a local facility at the time there was a local vet that did rehab and that's when I began to learn a little bit about canine rehab and that process and as many dogs do she did injure the second knee And this time we decided to do um, conservative management, braced her. So I went through the whole rehab experience again, only now with a brace. And, you know, it's a lot, um, sometimes I wonder as therapists, not that we forget, but to go through that experience with your dog, not just the injury, but the surgery, the recovery, the management at home, like when you come out of a clinic setting, all of those elements and just wanting your dog to be better because even I think, cause later on, even as a rehab therapist, it's, you're still like your dog is still your dog first. So we went through that whole process. I did a ton of rehab with her and that's actually my entry into canine rehab because that's where I learned that physiotherapists, physical therapists could do additional training to work in that field. And that's, basically what happened to me at that point in my life. From there, she actually um, did develop cancer after her second cruciate tear, which, you know, is part, part of this whole, we've been through a lot (laughs) with my own, with her. Um, There was another incident later on um, and she had a spindle cell sarcoma. So we were able to do surgery. She did really well. Later on, another year later or so, she was again playing with Reggie. This time we were at the beach and 
let out this big yelp and then this continuous crying that went on. And at this point I was in school for canine rehab or sorry, I was in school for physio. And of course, right away, I brought her back to the vet, complete panic at this point because the crying was continuous. She had um, osteophytes, lower lumbar kind of area. And we were able to, again, do lots of um, rehab with her to help her. And when she first started to show this sort of wobble in her back end, um, we thought it was related, related to what was going on with her, um, with the osteophytes and the arthritis in the spine, that type of thing. And it wasn't actually, I'm having this sort of, sorry. It was presenting just like, everybody's like, oh, she probably just has arthritis. She'll be okay, mm -hmm. that type of thing. And you kind of know in your gut when something's not right with your dog, um, you know, that sixth sense. And I actually had another veterinarian that was visiting from out of province and she looked at Sam and she was looking at how she was moving and she was like, you know, I think your dog has something called degenerative myelopathy, otherwise known as DM. And that's really, that's really why you and I are chatting today because that whole experience was a very powerful experience. Having an injury with your dog, like a cruciate tear and going through that process and going through surgery is a lot to work through. Getting a diagnosis that your dog's not gonna get better is like, I'm gonna get emotional when I talk about it, is a completely different world. Um, and, but we went through that journey. Like we went from, you know, I'm familiar with getting the news and the sense of overwhelm that you feel. And then when that realization sinks in, when I was on my first training course for rehab and met a dog with DM, and it just sunk into me what my dog's future look like, was gonna look like. It was completely overwhelming for me. But through that experience, I ended up you know, accessing a lot of people and a lot of people that knew a lot more than me. So in terms of having a good support team and things like that, and had already done so much rehab with her for her legs that we were able to go through that DM journey probably a lot longer than many people would, but I also had a lot of support um, from a lot of different areas, from rehab to different types of equipment, you know, carts, harnesses, all of those things, nutrition. I, you know, had an integrative vet that was helping on that side, which was a really big part of it. But going through that journey of watching your dog lose mobility in their back end struggling to figure out how to use a dog cart. Um, it's a really cute story actually, because at first she wouldn't walk in it. And then once she kind of figured it out, she tried to run away from it, <laughs> but it was attached to her. <laughs> um, but then also on the flip side of that, seeing my dog that had was losing her independence, regain some independence and how good that felt. Um, you know, I've been through all of those processes of like, you know, going through the rehab side, but also going through, you know, the first accident in the house, um, you know, watching, you know, the decision to take her feet up and put them in stirrups, recognizing that it was that time, um, you know, watching the condition progress. So, you know, harnesses, <laughs> people would ask me how I am. They asked me if I would work out and I was like, no, these biceps are from lifting my dog. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it's a bit of a long answer, but um, from a, it's a very personal story because we went through cancer, we went through cruciate tears, we went through a lot of stuff. Um, but DM was the one that was the one that really changed things and taught me a lot because mm. these dogs, like they just, they're so resilient and so adaptive and it's so much harder for us than it is for our, our pets in a lot of ways. Um, you know, she was incredibly patient. She taught me to be patient. <laughs> so, yeah. They say that animals come into our lives to teach us things, right? Um, and so, I mean, I think about what you've gone through and what you've learned. 
um, you know, it's really prepared you for your patients and your clients. Um, because I think as vet rehabbers, you know, in conditions like DM, where um, I don't think that, and this is obviously just a generalization now, I don't think that the vets have a lot of time, right, mm -hmm. to go through everything that we're able to go through. They don't have that thought process because in rehabilitation, we're thinking about mobility, we're thinking about everything, the house, mm -hmm. environment, everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so you are so prepared now, you know, from everything you've, and you've what she's taught you um, to be able to um, teach your, your clients um, but also now, obviously, you're teaching other pet owners all over the world because you created this Facebook group. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I've got you on today because I, I really believe that you can teach us vet rehabbers. You know, I think that these conditions like DM, like what, something that you said really stuck with me. is like a condition that's not going to get better. Um, and so when we, we deal with these patients and, and the owners, you know, there's so many things that we have to think about. The one is treating yeah. the patients. The other, two, the other one is being an emotional support um, for, that, for that client um, and to educate them, to, to be able to empower them with knowledge, to be able mm -hmm. to help their pets um, so that both the owner and um, the animal is able to have some quality of life. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to dive into this topic with you. Um, so yeah, tell us about the, the Facebook group and why you actually started it. So um, I actually have two. One is actually specific to DM, but we'll kind of travel into that one in a minute. I actually put off, <laughs> off the group is called Living with Dogs with Disabilities. Um, and the title Living was very intentional because we really... And I say we, because I bounce the idea off a lot of people, really wanted to emphasize that just because your dog has some kind of new diagnosis or new condition, that they can still live a good life. They can still thrive in some sense. It's not, um, you know, it's not managing, it's, it's living. But I put off starting that group for a long time um, because I, probably because I knew there was such a need for it that I knew it was going to be a lot, <laughs> um, bringing it on and that type of thing. And it really has been, but it, it, it's taken off on its own. So the group is meant to, I had mentioned when I was talking about Sammy, all of these other things, all of these people that I had access to, to support along the journey, to teach me. And I really feel like she brought those people into our lives and realizing especially during because the group I launched it last year um, in very end of June so it was right you know right during COVID crazy times and feeling like people really needed the support and also just really struggling with you know I'd look on those other groups like the big DM groups and other groups and everybody wants to really help but I was just remembering where I was when I started this journey and can only imagine posting a question, like something around toileting or something and getting 150 responses. Like it would just the overwhelm of going through that experience. So I really wanted to create something that people could support each other because people, there's a lot of support in that community, but also have access to professionals in the field and the knowledge that they can share so that people aren't kind of pulling information from all over the place. Um, so it's, it's really been a place that people can learn, be supported in a learning environment, but also have access to professionals in the field that have a lot of experience as well. And so the idea was to do interviews and that's kind of the basis of the group. There's a lot of dialogue, I share posts, but the expert content, if you want to call it that, comes from doing these interviews so that people can actually come in. We do interviews, we do live Q and A's and ask questions, whether it's about, you know, laser therapy or PEMF or hip dysplasia and exercises. And I've even brought in um, an integrative vet that can cover some nutritional stuff and that type of thing. So it's pulling on my resources so that the community can, can gain that knowledge. Um, that's a big, part of why I started it is I really just wanted to help bring people together and 
connect them and then give them um, professional advice in addition to the support that they're getting. Um, I've realized it's kind of, it's heartbreaking to me because I mean, DM is something that's close to my heart, but there's a lot of people in the group that have dogs with um, all kinds of conditions from tripods to IVDD, that type of thing. Um, but it's, a, it's in, in some ways almost heartbreaking how they go through this experience with their dog and they just think that's it. Especially IVDD is one that sticks out in my brain a lot because a lot of people don't even realize that there's hope for these dogs in a lot of cases or FCE, like, yeah, FCEs, that these dogs might actually walk again. They think that it's gonna be over, like that's, this is their new life. So being able to provide some education from people that have a lot of experience in that, for sure, it is good. What do you think the biggest challenges the owners face having a dog with a disability? Well, um, I guess part, um, my initial answer to that would be, it depends on the disability to an extent, but I'm gonna back up one step more because I had a really interesting epiphany um, because when we think of dogs with disabilities, we tend to think of, and I say dog parents a lot because the people I tend to work with are dog parents, but dog owners, dog parents, it's all kind of the same. Um, I was talking to someone that with an athlete, a canine athlete, whose dog um, went through a traumatic injury and she was rehabbing that her dog. And her initial experience, even as a professional in the field, is the same as the dog parents, coach dog potato experience of going through that sense of overwhelm. What am I gonna do now? What does this mean? Is my dog in pain? What do I do? And I think that initial starting point, it doesn't matter who you are. You, we, I think we all start in the same place. It's just what happens from there. So I think that, it, and when you ask me what the challenge is for, the, for people, I think the cha biggest challenge is, happens in the beginning of understanding what's going on and being able to move forward from there versus getting stuck there which isn't really a rehab thing. It's, it's more like you said on the educational side of it. But to me, that's one of the biggest challenges they face is just overwhelm and getting stuck in the diagnosis and where to go from there. Yeah, I mean, I think as vet rehabbers, we are here to guide them through all mm -hmm. of it, right? Um, are there any tips and advice that you can give, you know, a vet rehab therapist that maybe their patient comes in for the first time, the owner's just got the shock of having a DM diagnosis. What tips can advice could you give them to guide them in a smooth way so that they that we can reduce that overwhelm? I think one of the biggest things like I've started doing with um, clients that I have with dogs with DM, I schedule way more time for these dogs. Like, if my assessment, my usual, and I know everybody's different, but my usual appointments are 45 minutes. My ass assessments would be an hour to an hour and a half. I'll block out two hours because we just spend a lot of time talking. I'm not working with the dog. It, it's spending a lot of time just initially helping them kind of process what's going on. And also to let them know that um, there are things that they can do to help their dog. So one of the biggest pieces of advice I have, whether it's for the dog owner or the rehab therapist talking to the dog owner is to begin to really try, we can't control the outcome. We know what the outcome is gonna be if we're talking about DM, but we can take some control of the process. And I think empowerment comes through being able to control some of that process and helping the dog parent or the owner be part of that process. So again, with COVID, it's really changed a lot because I've started offering more things online because of COVID, because so many people can't go into the clinics with their dogs. So they don't even really know what's going on when they go in. It's stressful for the vets. It's stressful for the rehab therapist because everything's different in our world right now. The processes are all different. 
Um, so being able to create some type of way of connecting on a, a little bit more of a personal level, whether it's, you know, having video or a phone going or something, and then giving them also things to be able to do at home, not too many. <laughs> I think we, we know that, but um, that initial appointment is really, a, it, it's about helping them understand what's going on a little bit, letting them know that they're not alone in the journey. I think that's something else that's really come up for me is that a lot of people feel isolated because DM's not as common as some of the other conditions. Although to me, it, feel, it feels like it is, but um, so people tend to feel very isolated through their experiences and they don't, and almost like afraid to talk about certain things. Like, again, I go back to toileting, but I remember somebody said to me, you know, my dog leaves me gifts during the night. Um, but at first she, she didn't realize like, this is a normal part of the, this is normal and it's okay to talk about it. Um, so being able to really have that open dialogue, I think is, is more than anything really important and to give them some sense of control over something that they can't control by helping them focus on the process and that their dog is still their dog at the end of the day. Um, it's a diagnosis. It doesn't mean your dog's not the same dog they were yesterday. They're still your dog. Um, yeah, and I think we have to be careful not to contribute to the overwhelm. Yeah. So like if I think absolutely. back to cases, you know, especially when you're used to, like, like if we are used to seeing these cases often, you know, so mm -hmm. like in a week, you know, I, I, I saw loads of DM cases. So you sort of get used to what you need to say. Um, and I can recall like once or twice just looking at an owner thinking their eyes were just big and I could just think like this is like content overload for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually thinking like take a step back. You, you, you've said too much. Like they, they, it's already a shock for them. And I think sometimes they don't have all the knowledge coming from the vet. Um, and yeah. they said people then, and then so then you you might actually say things that completely shock them that they, they weren't actually aware of. And then they they still trying to process, you know, this is actually what's gonna happen. You know, this is the, the progression of this condition. And um, and then you, you sort of go through that very quickly and then you start talking about all the things that you can do um, to help. And they they're still thinking about the first thing that you said. Um, so I think it's right. important. Uh, we don't want to contribute to it. I mean, do you have a, a handout or something like that that you give them or do you email them information? Because I, I mean, I find often in that first consult, especially with, with conditions like DM, when it is, yeah. it can be a little bit overwhelming and can be a little bit emotional. Um, then, you know, to give them something afterwards that they can mm -hmm. then go back and have a look over, then they can sort of recap. Yeah, absolutely. And I totally agree. I think one of the reasons why we schedule that early session for such a long time is to let them talk. So like you said, for us to kind of try to not talk a lot <laughs> to answer questions, but to let them, let them talk through it. Um, I do have some handouts, but something I've actually, because I mentioned that other group a little bit. So I, it's called navigating DM while creating connection. And what I had done back in uh, probably about a month and a half ago it was the beginning of December was I actually launched a one week virtual event for dog parents. And we started the event with a webinar type presentation on DM and then went through a little bit of sharing content every day. And we finished it with this group Zoom discussion where everybody could come into the room and ask questions and there was professionals and there was dog parents and there was handlers and everybody could interact with each other. And I'm using a lot of that content now to help with people when they're starting that journey. So I've actually taken that initial presentation that we did in the beginning and turned that into a webinar. And when I'm working with my own clients, I actually say, you know, on your own time, it's about 40 minutes, you know, when you watch, watch this. 
Um, it comes with a little handout and that type of thing. So I find that process because then they can come back with some questions and things from that. It also controls me from not over talking. <laughs> um, and I use other resources from that group as well. Um, so that's kind of in right now, how I manage those types of scenarios is um, I do often will get them to, you know, I put them into that group and I get them to watch that webinar as well as be connected to the other people. Cause I think that's the other piece of this. Um, when you were asking me Meg about how we work as professionals with these people, I actually think there's a lot of power in connecting them with other people going through similar experiences um, because we don't have all the answers and we're kind of also in a different place than them going through that experience. So I think they're, you know, and on our end, like for me, it's such, when I work with these dogs, I do get emotionally involved with it. So having also a group that way also <laughs> supports me a little bit because there's that group dynamic and that group support um, that way versus telling and talking with you know each person individually talking as a group makes it a lot easier how do you um how do you help them with the living parts you know so like you spoke about actually living like you know so they can like the dogs and them can have sort of a meaningful life. I mean, what are the tips and advice that you give them around that? So a couple things. Um, one is I actually created, and I didn't mention this before, but I created, and it's based off of my dog. It's called the SAM system, but it's support, adapt, move. So I actually create like a, a little handout for them that's very simple. Support, you know, the people and the equipment that you want to think about getting in that early stage of DM. Adapt is around... Um, what kind of things should you be changing in your environment? So when you're talking about the home, things like, you know, whether you're putting booties on their feet in the house or you're um, putting mats down on the floor so that they're not slipping, those types of things. Um, and then move is more of that therapeutic exercise plan. So I help them create this very basic um, plan to help them within the home. The other thing that I have really become really taken in is the fact that as rehab therapists, we have, I think we really need to recognize that even though we want them to do these exercises and we know the importance of doing those exercises and it's use it or lose it, whether we're talking about the muscles or the nervous system and how we're stimulating the nervous system. But if somebody's stuck with a hygiene issue with their dog or like I almost think of like Maslow's basic hierarchy of needs if we're not helping them understand sort of those very basic things around you know helping them navigate the home safely how to manage toileting and teaching them how to you know walk their dog with a harness and those types of things then we can't really be asking them to do the exercise component on top of it because their basic needs in their living environment aren't addressed. So I build that into, it doesn't feel like sort of traditional canine rehab, but I build that into our appointment times and I build that into um, learning. So again, I, I am taking a bit of a twist on things because I'm, I've started to do more group stuff and I'm actually putting together a group program for, um, dog parents of dogs would DM specifically so that we can cover a lot of those pieces. And then I can also do my rehab side of things as well. So I'm not sure if I totally answered your question, but in the very beginning, I would say, you know, that um, they need something that's gonna support the back end. They need something that's going to um, protect those hind feet. And some, in terms of the home, having, you know, something down on the floors or the booties on the feet to prevent slipping so that we're not getting secondary injuries. I usually start, depending on when, at what stage of DM the dog is when they come to me, that's where I usually start as far as the home goes is, um, you know, keeping the floors, you know, that type of thing um, and getting them some type of rear support 
or some type of harness, that kind of thing in that early stage. Again, not overwhelming because we could talk about all the other things they're gonna need, but in that beginning stage, that's kind of what they need for, for the home. Yeah, I mean, I think every case is also different, right? Like you have mm-hmm. to adapt to the environment depending on, um, you know, if they've got a split level, if they've got stairs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, one of the things I think I learned very quickly with wheelchairs is to ask them if they've got any hills or downhills or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, because you don't think about it. When you think about people, Absolutely. you know, you just think like you you can t- sort of decide where you want to go and you're not going to go down a hill, whereas a dog will just run and then the next minute they're like, the, you know, yeah, how, doing a tumble. <laughs> yeah, because it just, you know. Yeah. Um, so you got to be careful. Like, you know, like driveways, for example, you know, they think let's mm-hmm. go for a walk, put the dog in the in the, the wheelchair and then yeah. they start walking down the hill and suddenly realize they need to actually put their hand and stop, stop the dog from going too far. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I actually, in the very beginning, I ended up tying, uh, not, you know, a leash to the back of her cart <laughs> so that I could control that. But I mean, you have to watch out for different things. Um, when you get into a cart, like, you know, divots, ditches, that kind of stuff. It's, it's a totally different, different world that way for sure. Um, one of the things yeah. obviously also is is that that sort of decision to go into the cart, right? So a lot of them, you know, when they first come to us, maybe they don't need a cart. So they'll just have, you'll just maybe have a harness on them with a handle on the back that you can help and support them. And then the conversation to go into a cart, that's a whole other thing, right? Because um, mm-hmm. it's sort of like for them, this is now coming towards the end, you know, that they have to make this decision. And sometimes I think, you know, if I think back to my clients, they were hesitant, you know, like, no, it can't be the time now, you know? Um, but I the think cur- sometimes we got to mm-hmm. actually put them in sooner than later mm-hmm. um, well, because they end up actually doing more damage to themselves. And so I always call a dog cart, a dog cart very intentionally. I don't call it a wheelchair because we have a connotation that goes along with wheelchair, right? We think of a wheelchair as a we're a passive participant. It's a decline in independence that puts us in a wheelchair. A dog cart, and I I really try to position it this way when I'm working with people, a dog cart is a mobility device. It's independence. It's giving your dog back something. It's saving your own body and it's letting them navigate their own world freely. Um, And to what you were saying as well, it, it, does prevent more in more injury. And I remember going through that with Sam and, you know, when do you get the cart? Because you're absolutely right. If we wait until a dog has total loss of mobility in the hind end, it's too overwhelming for everybody to introduce the cart at that stage. Giving it, I really believe that if you give it a little bit earlier, they can still ambulate with their back legs. And, but they're at less of a risk of falling because they're supported by the cart and then they can, you know, you can adjust as the condition progresses. So I don't see it necessarily as a disease progression. I see it as a way of enabling them to still be engaged in their environment and be active and independent. Yeah, I love that. So I call it a cart because it actually enhances their life. It's not like a, a wheelchair. And you're right, because that, you know, when we think about wheelchair, we, we do think about like, disability and I know we've been using that word but you Mm. you think about somebody that needs help like Mm -hmm. without that wheelchair they can't get around sometimes these animals can get around without the wheelchair but they're just not doing it well enough and the the car just enhances and also enables them to go for longer walks right absolutely supports them and allows them to have that laugh you know go for walks with the rest of the dogs where sometimes that dm dog will do one like block and then mm. the owner will put them away and then take the dog that race the, the other dogs for a longer walk right because the dm dog just can't keep yes, up yes exactly and it's funny you say that because it, it would vote you know longer walks in different environments because <laughs> i'm laughing because sam and reggie love the beach so i literally and we have very rocky beaches in nova scotia to get down some of them are sandy but some of them are rocky so i would like she'd be dragging me and i'd be like supporting the back end of her cart over all of this cobblestone rock and get down to the beach and people would laugh at me because i'd be chasing her down the beach and she'd be running full tilt after my other dog in her dog cart 
And to me, that's living with a dog with a disability, right? Like she was like running in the water. She's playing with sticks. She's digging in the sand. She's just doing it with some extra support. Yeah. So she doesn't fall down, right? Um, so yeah, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot that the dog cart can enable people to do for sure. And I think that, again, introducing it earlier and then as therapists, then we think, then you have an opportunity to work, also work on core stability. Cause sometimes people think, well, if I put my dog in the dog cart too soon, they're gonna lose their core strain. But we can focus some tailored exercises on core stability. So the cart's supporting them while they're dynamic, you know, they're moving and they're still using their back legs, whether we're using mobility, other devices like, you know, dorsiflex assist or the Beco braces or stuff like that. Um, and then we do some therapeutic exercises so they still get their core. But I think being able to navigate the environment uh, is really important. And for them to have as much of their normal life as possible. Like when you get that diagnosis, that doesn't mean your dog can't go to the dog park anymore, mm. right? Um, you should be a little bit more cognizant of when they're interacting with other dogs. And yes, you should have something on their feet to protect them. And whether you're at the stage of a dog cart or if you're still using a harness, but they can still do those things. They just look a little bit different. And I think that's a really important message to give people is that it's, you know, I, I have this quote, and I was gonna save it for the end, but it, it, it's, it's not over, it's just different, is, yeah. is kind of the philosophy I approach DM with, with dog parents. So you must have learned so much from your Facebook community. So what's the, the biggest thing that you've learned from them? Oh my gosh, actually quite a, quite a bit. Um, the, the thing that I mentioned around sort of the hierarchy of needs, uh, that was one piece of it. Cause I'm like, you know, I really want to talk about this and everybody wants to talk about, you know, bladder <laughs> and that kind of stuff. But recognizing again, that, you know, managing those very basic needs to, in order to get our bigger messages across. Um, I was blown away, Meg, by the number of people that try to navigate this stuff on their own. Um, I had no idea <laughs> how much, how little, uh, I don't know if little support is the right word, but how they were kind of given a diagnosis and then that's it. Like, and then they're kind of figuring out all these other elements on their own. So I, I you know, but in that I was also amazed at the innovation that people come up with in what they do, especially once they get over the overwhelm, if they have the support piece is really, really important. And I think that, um, you know, that's something we also as practitioners need to um, encourage from that standpoint, but so the professional support and the group support. And then people get very innovative and creative in how they're supporting their dogs and helping their dogs and sharing their success stories. So, you know, the resilience and the innovation and that people really wanna support each other and help each other as well. So it's, for lack of a better way of putting it, it's not all about us and our profession and helping them. It's also about the group support piece of it and what they get from that. So what is it that you want to teach every pet owner that has a disabled pet? Um, that it's to focus on the process and not the outcome would be part of it. But to do that, you need to have group support and you need to have someone that can help help you navigate it. Like this is a lot of these conditions, regardless of whether it's a cruciate tear and your dog's gonna recover or it's DM and your dog's gonna progressively get worse. We're not meant, to, you're not meant to do this by yourself. Um, you, you need somebody in your corner helping you beyond Facebook. <laughs> I think a lot of people don't quite see the difference between um, I've had this conversation a lot with people, the difference between getting advice through like a post in a newsfeed, like, hey, my dog's going through this, 
what should I do versus actually sitting down with somebody who knows a bit about your dog can look at the whole history of the dog and help guide you a little bit. And then you take in that group support. So you need somebody in your corner and then you need that group support. Um, and then focusing on the process, not on the outcome would be a big part of it. And that going back to, it's not over, it's just different. So looking at ways that your, your dog can still be active, still do enrichment, engage in the world around them, even though it looks different than it did before. Um, it's not, because it, it, it's not over. We just get stuck there, but it, it, that's temporary. We can, there's lots you can do. It's just getting yeah, through I the, think focus on when the process. When they get that diagnosis, it can be a bit shocking for them. So I think we're there to Absolutely. give them hope, right? We give them to give 100%. them hope and to let them know that it isn't over. There's lots that we can do. So for those um, vet rehabbers that want to join your group, um, it's living with dogs with disabilities, right? Yeah. So what I've done is I have living with dogs with disabilities is my free big group that we have. Um, and then with all the interviews, and then I started to take a lot of DM very focused information and putting it into um, navigating DM while creating connections. So that is, I've created it as a members group, but it's like a one-time fee because everybody that is in there has participated in the virtual event. So it's, it's not very much, but it's more of, I just want to make sure that the people coming into that space, um, I really want to help their dog and it's very focused on DM specifically. Yeah. So and then um, if a vet rehabber has a client, let's say, that um, wants to find out more information, you said that you were putting a program together. Where would they find out that information? Because I think it's quite handy, especially for vet rehabbers that have a really busy clinic. You know, yeah. like I know that a lot of us don't have two hours to, to have a consult, Absolutely. you know, so yeah. like those really busy clinics where, you know, it'll be great to send your client to give them some information and say, like, mm -hmm. if you want to dive deeper into this and maybe just have a look at the process and things that you can do um, to be able to send them to a website where they can get this information mm -hmm. and a website that we know and trust, you know, because there are lots of pet yeah. owners that just, you know, have gone through something exactly. and then they decide, oh, they're going to create a website. Um, so, to have a fellow vet we have a um teaching this and guiding um other our clients you know um i think is really really useful absolutely and i completely agree and so my my business website is upwarddogrehab.com um and within that i have a group learning um, I want to say group learning portal, as well as a virtual classroom that people can go into. When people want to do that um, DM webinar, you get automatic access when you, if you buy the DM webinar, automatic access right into that Facebook group as well, um, the navigating DM one. So that's where I would tell people to go is the, and you can reach out to me. <laughs> people can contact me on Facebook. They, they do that a lot and um, I can help sort of move people in different directions, but the program, the webinar and other content that I'm creating uh, can be accessed through the website or can be accessed through um, those Facebook groups. And I think that it's really, I'm glad you mentioned other professions because I, I think that's something that we can do is we can support each other and pull from each other, like send, our clients to where we know there's good information on different conditions to help them. I actually had somebody I brought into the group last night that said, my PT sent me here. And I was like, yay. Awesome. So yeah, so definitely upwarddogrehab.com is my business page, but people can reach out to me on Facebook or through my business page, my website as well. And we'll connect them to help these DM dogs. I'm Thank you so parents. much, Sarah. Um, for the listeners, we will put all those URLs um, in the description. Thank you so much for your time and thank you thank for sharing you. your story. It's been amazing chatting to you. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm, I'm really glad we had this conversation. It's, you know, lots of hope out there for these guys. There is for sure. Thank you thank for you, all Meg. you do. Cheers, thank Sarah. you.
If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review. And know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers, so if you are looking for more continued education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.